Hi everyone, I'm Scott Schneider. This is Stereo Niche. This week, it's the most iconic JBL speaker ever made, the Hartsfield. Well, I've been talking about it for several weeks now and hinting at, you know, the upcoming video for the JBL Hartsfield, and it's time to do that. Before I get there, though, and get started, I want to explain something that's a very unique about this particular video and something I've never done before. These speakers are actually not mine. I actually agreed to do this video um, because I've, I've taken these on on consignment to sell them for the owner. Now, I just want to set the record straight right up front. That's not something I plan to do uh, going forward. It just happens to be something that was so exceptional, uh, so iconic, and something I probably would never get a chance to see or hear, so I decided to do that. And so, if you are in the market for a set of JBL Hartsfields, reach out. Um, I won't put the you know, pricing or anything in this video because I can't go back and edit that. Um, so once they're sold, I'll put the updated information in the description um, and maybe in the title as well, because those are things that I can edit. But um, if you are in the market, again, reach out. They are two JBL Hartsfields. You can only see one uh, at the moment, but uh, you'll see both of them. Um, they are uh, two slightly different, uh, I think, I'm pretty sure they were mono systems originally, which is very common. Uh, the only difference between the two is that one of them has the uh, N500 crossover, the other one has the N500H crossover. Other than that, both have the correct period, correct drivers, and they are fully functional. So I'll go through a description of the Hartsfield in general and go through some of their history. I think probably top five most collectible, highly sought after speaker ever. And I don't say that lightly. There are a lot of great collectible speakers out there. In fact, I saw a channel uh, recently cover the five most collectible speakers. Um, which I thought was an interesting selection. I, they, were, they were nice speakers. I wouldn't say they were top five as far as a, um, let's say, Pebble Beach uh, arena. If you want to say that there, if there were a Pebble Beach a vintage speakers uh, event, um, the JBL Hartsfield and the Paragon, the, uh, the JBL Everest, um, those would be the type of speakers that would be in that sort of upper echelon highly most sought after desired speakers. When you think about a 1957 Gullwing Mercedes, that's what we think about when we talk about the upper echelons of collectability. And in the speaker side of things, the JBL Hartsfield is in that category, in that kind of company. So let's talk about the history of the Hartsfield just a little. Uh, it is the speaker that put JBL on the map. Um, that is you know, a bit of what I guess speaker historians say. And uh, the reason is JBL was a rather fledgling company at this time frame. And it was um, an article that was written in Life Magazine in February of 1955 that launched the Hartsfield into the minds of the consumer. And the article wasn't that large, but what it did was it, it was talking about hi-fi purchasing and it put together, I think, four different categories, a budget system, a medium system, um, a, a sort of a, a nice system, and then the dream system. And the dream system incorporated, I think it was a Macintosh amp, um, the JBL Hartsfield, a Fisher tuner, uh, I think that was, and a, and a Garrard um, turntable. And that was the dream system. And following that article, it launched the JBL Hartsville into the consciousness, I guess, of the well-heeled buyer. Um, particularly in the uh, California Hollywood area, it, it looked like, as far as I can tell, JBL had a, a presence out there. And so um, the local, uh, I guess, stars and people who had money 
uh, came in and were purchasing the speaker in fairly decent numbers. So there's probably quite a few that have come through the California area uh, just for that reason. Um, so that is what launched JBL. Uh, JBL put um, their best gear and their best drivers into the Hartsfield. Um, it's named that because a fellow named Bill Hartsfield uh, designed them. Now, the Hartsfield owes its history and the fact that it's even in existence to the Clipshorn. The Clipshorn was developed in 1949 and it created the, the folded horn design, uh, horn driven design, and is what launched the ability of speakers to, you know, get a, a basically a full range sound because it was able to, um, with support from corners, it's called a corner horn, uh, because it's uh, bolstered by being placed into a corner. It actually helps the folded horn, um, you know, bring up the bottom end, if you will. So after the development of the clips horn, any speaker company launched their own versions, you know, off of that design and were, you know, building, building on that principle. So Bill Hartsfield, as I understand it, was a sort of an enthusiast. He was, an, I believe he was an engineer, but he didn't work for JBL. He ended up uh, or happened to know the marketing VP of JBL at the time. And that person was aware of Bill Hartsfield's personal design of his own folded horn. And they hired him as a consultant to design and you know fully design the Hartsfield. And so that is how the Hartsfield came into existence from basically, I, I would say an enthusiast, a DIY guy who developed his own. And then that was then translated into a final product at JBL. Well, it became a huge success. It's what, um, historians, I guess, say, uh, put JBL on the map and, and really established them as a company. Um, I think probably a lot of people are thinking, you know, think a lot first about the Paragon, but according to the information I read, it's actually the Hartsfield that, you know, got JBL the traction it needed. I'm sure the, the cash flow that it needed to become a much more successful company. So that's a bit of history. Um, we'll, I'm going to break the video up into several sections. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll move on from here and talk about some other parts of the JBL Hartsfield. All right. Well, you know, I never get the chance to go into as much detail and depth as I will for this one, because I never had the, uh, the drivers separate uh, from the units I've been showcasing. But in this case, I actually have all of the drivers and the crossover for the JBL Hartsfield. Now, these are not the drivers from these units. Uh, about four years ago, uh, I happened upon a fellow who had his father's speakers that he custom built in the 1950s. And he built two of them, but he built one of them in 1954 and he was able to acquire the, uh, the same drivers that are in the Hartsfield. Unfortunately, it wasn't a Hartsfield speaker that he built. Um, he had the, uh, some plans uh, from JBL, and I th I'm pretty sure it preceded uh, the Hartsfield. So he had, uh, was able to acquire the drivers and he built his own you know, system. Um, and then 1958, when stereo came out, he went out and bought different, slightly different drivers, still good drivers, but different from the ones he was able to acquire before and built another speaker. So unfortunately they weren't matched. Um, but you know, I was able to acquire the components of, um, what was, what's in a Hartsfield and what's in these two speakers. So, uh, I wanted to uh, go through that with you so you can see what do drivers look like of the day and you know, what's in particular, what's in the Hartsfield. But, um, what I want to start off with is this is the crossover network. So back in that time frame in the 1950s, and something I mentioned in the, um, the Jensen uh, Imperial Review last week, it was very common for you to go buy your drivers and your system components. It was called a kit typically. And you could go buy your kit and they would give you the plans to come home and then cut your wood and put together your own cabinet. And they were based on you know, designs that you know, they, they would have sold uh, at retail, except it was a lot more expensive. You could probably, you know, build your own um, cabinet and everything for, you know, maybe 
uh, 50%, 60% the cost of buying it completely done, you know, from the company. So this is a crossover network and someone ironically just yesterday sent me a note asking if I was going to recap these, the, uh, the, JB, uh, the Jensen uh, Imperial speakers. And um, I have replied, probably not, um, because the capacitors are inside this box. But they're not just sitting there inside the box. They're inside um, of this box and they're potted. Now, potted means they are sealed into a chemical or a solution that was, when heated, was sort of liquefied, poured into this, and then it solidified. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the material is, if it's a wax or a resin, I'm not quite sure. But in any case, to get it out, you have to take your, your crossover box here and put it in boiling water for a significant amount of time to heat up the potted chemical and melt it basically, and then pull out your components in here to get the opportunity to then replace them and then put them back. So not something that's um, very quick, very easy to do. Um, from what I've read, uh, when the chemical heats up, it's rather smelly and you certainly don't want to do it inside your house. Uh, you want to do it external and um, it does take a good bit of time. So you need to heat it up for an extended period. So I happened to see a fellow on uh, that created a YouTube video of this. Uh, and I'll, if I can find it, I'll put the link in the description. But um, if I paid attention well to his video, he does it for hire. So I think I would um, reach out to him and, you know, see if this is something he would tackle and um, probably pursue that avenue before I would probably try to do it myself. Um, I do most everything for speakers myself, but that's probably not something um, that I want to do once uh, or ever. And so, you know, I'd probably reach out to him and see if he'll do it. Uh, so this is the crossover network. Now this is an N500, and this is the only difference between the two speakers. Um, this one has the N500, which is, I believe, the earlier crossover, the original. And in the other one, it's a little bit later, it's called the N500H. Now, um, spec-wise, they're the same, I believe. I don't know of any difference there. Um, but they are different in size. The, the N500H is a pretty good bit smaller, and it does mount to a, a uh, access hole in the side um, of the panel, on the back side. So you can get to it from the outside. This one, uh, being as large as it is, um, actually sits down flat uh, and is screwed into the inside next to the tweeter. So that's the only difference uh, between the two. The drivers themselves are exactly the same in both speakers. Um, so that's the crossover network. On the woofer, the woofer is mounted in this lower section from this point behind the tweeter. There is a board that's a triangular shape um, that, that sort of uh, encapsulates the lower end here, and it's what creates the folded horn. So. I'll show you a diagram of what the folded horn looks like. And if you can see that hole sort of in the middle there, and there's an, there's an arrow sort of going down and toward the front, and then down around the chamber, up to the back side, around, and then comes out the front. That is the folded horn. And that is what this 150-4 woofer, 15-inch woofer, um, is, is driving. So this is the very heavily and overbuilt uh, woofer um, that is mounted inside of the JBL Hartsfield. Um, these drivers, by the way, as I read, were originally designed um, for movie theaters. And based on their heft, uh, I can certainly tell you that they certainly feel like they're made for a bit of a, you know, an industrial application like a movie theater. They just have that heft. So this is uh, the tweeter, this is a 375 driver, tweeter driver on the back side here mounted to this horn, rather large horn. And this, this thing weighs a lot more than the woofer. This is probably 30 pounds or more. Now this is on the inside of the cabinet. Through the cabinet, um, you put the screws go through there and mount into the back side of this acoustical lens, which gives it such a distinctive um, look. 
and really sets it apart from, from anything else, really. When you see that, uh, you know it's a JBL. Um, JBL is the only one that um, the acoustical lens here, I assume, is the first application in the Hartsfield. They had other speakers over the years that had a you know similar look type of a acoustical lens. So it gives it that dispersion of, of, the, uh, of the music um, and, and sets it apart. So uh, inside, by the way, um, quite an interesting um, design of the cabinet. On the back side, there's a, there are two panels, one on each side. And then if you remove the top set of screws, this whole top just pulls right off. Um, there are some dowels on each end uh, that it mounts into, and it will pull straight up and off. Once you do that, you then have access to the, um, the um, tweeter. Uh, once you disassemble the tweeter there from the lens, uh, there are two bolts are, that are they're, they're sticking up here that are mount to, the, to the, uh, the tweeter to the cabinet. You pull this out, and then after you've removed that, um, the crossover is mounted to a board that is, um, gives you access to the woofer. So you then have to remove that to get access to the woofer that's buried inside. So I've, give, I've uh, created a video uh, showing you putting it back together essentially to, to give you an idea of what it looks like. I also need to do that uh, to confirm what drivers are inside of each cabinet. Um, I'm only gonna show you one, but if someone wants to see both, uh, certainly reach out and let me know, but uh, we'll take a look at that now.
All right. Well, I've told you about the history of JBLs. I've shown you what the drivers look like and some of the internals so you could see, uh, get a good feel for how they're built and how they're put together. Uh, that was something new I hadn't done before. Um, but how do they sound, right? That's what everybody really wants to know at the end of the day. Um, some of you actually also want to hear them. Um, well, I'll have to harken back to one of my very first videos uh, where I explained that, that what I would play on these, while you might be entertained, you might like the selection of music, you're going to hear your speakers. You're not going to hear what they actually sound like. Um, I know that's a little bit uh, different than others who like to just, you know, turn the music on and just play them and think that's a demo. But, you know, I, that's, that's not my uh, method here and it's probably not something I'll ever do. Um, so I will describe it as best I can. Um, now let's start with perception. Uh, so as with any speaker, you come in with some preconception of what you think you're going to hear. And these are certainly iconic. Um, so I sort of had, uh, you know, a, a preconception because I've had some, I have some other 50 speakers and I've experienced them, horn driven speakers. I just listened to the, the Jensen uh, Imperials uh, recently. And so kind of had a, an idea of what I thought I was going to hear. Well, it was different than that. It wasn't exactly what I was expecting. Um, it was much more dynamic. It was much more modern than I expected at all. On the older speakers, typically from the 50s, I find them have, I, I've always found them to be a bit laid back. And part of that is because of the technology for the high end, the tweeters, was just different back then. It wasn't as sophisticated. I have always felt, and in my experience with speakers from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, that the high-end tweeter technology got much better in the 70s. And by that time, um, the high-end was much more crisp and clear and defined. And in prior years before that, it was much more laid back, but still pleasant. Well, the, there's two things about the JBLs that I found quite unique. So the compression driver, the 375, was much brighter than I was expecting. I just wasn't expecting a driver that covers everything from 500 up to be as lively as it was. The other part of it is, is the lens itself. That sort of gave a much, a much airiness to the music. And whereas most horns are a bit, you know, straight at you, you know, and, and that was, gives it a bit of that liveliness, um, this was, I'll, I, to me, it felt more modern and, uh, um, be, being dispersed, you know, and the musical information sort of, you know, being around the room and that, that soundstage. And that kind of threw me off um, because I felt like they were, they could be competitive with much newer speakers. And that's the part that I found so fascinating and so fantastically wonderful about them um, is that I think they could compete with speakers, uh, you know, that are modern, essentially. Um, they, they were, from, from my pers perspective, they were very much ahead of their time. If the consumer was able to hear this level of detail and experience this back in the 50s, Wow, they were they were quite spoiled um, because I don't think there were any other speakers uh, that sounded like these. Other speakers, um, other top of the line speakers, I'm sure sounded very good and you know in their own right, and they had their own sound signature, which every speaker does, from the Teals to the ARs to the JBLs. Uh, they all have their own sound. They do sound different, um, and these are set apart as well, and so. I was, uh, and, and, and I am, uh, just flabbergasted, to be honest with you, at how great these 70-year-old speakers can sound and how modern they actually sound. Uh, and that, to me, was the, the wow uh, sort of moment. It took me a few minutes when I first turned them on, uh, and I've had this a few times, this experience, for stats, for example. The first time I ever heard electrostats, 
it was it was a, a feeling of what's going on here and it took me a few minutes for my ears to sort of adjust. Well, I kind of had that with these as well because my expectation was different than what I experienced. And so I was sort of expecting, you know, one thing and got another. And so it threw me off for a few minutes. Uh, but in a good way. It was a, a aha, wow, kind of a kind of experience. And you know, I kind of have always thought that the um, the desirability of, and the collectability of the speakers was primarily driven because they were very expensive, very rare, um, and I thought that was the main drivers of seeking them out. But now having experienced them, I can say that I think also it is how unique they sound and how lively they sound. I think that is part of the equation. If you hear these, um, I think you will be taken aback by how great they can sound. And that, and that to me sets them apart from anything. Um, it'll be sad when they you know, move on. Um, unfortunately, I don't own them. So you know, again, if you're an interested buyer, reach out. Um, I will give you all the history and any information about them. Um, much more uh, pictures and detail about them that I have. Um, I couldn't fit it all in the video. But uh, anyway, it'll be a sad day when I see them leave um, because they are uh, set apart from, from everything else. They are an icon iconic speaker for many reasons. Well, thank you guys for tuning in for one. Um, it's been a bit of a long video. Hope you appreciated the content. Try to give you something a little more in depth. I don't think uh, has been done for these speakers before. So hope you appreciate that. If you do, give us a thumbs up. And uh, if you don't want to miss the next video, you know, hit subscribe. And as always, we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.